Hello, everybody. Welcome to lecture four. So the first week we talked about general trade patterns and we introduced the gravity model of trade. Week two and week three, we talked about the Ricardian model of trade. Week four and week five, we'll introduce and study a new model of trade for us, but pretty old in the world. And this trade model is called the Hexture Olin model, also called the HO model or the HO theory. So as usual, uh, we will divide the lecture into several modules. And uh, when I feel that we have reached a certain point where some important concepts have been covered, I'll close the module, then I'll start a new one to begin a new module. So if you haven't fully grasped what I've said, you can go back and review the file. And then you can again go and study the rest of the modules. Okay, so that you, got, you, you have this continuity in terms of understanding and you don't miss some bits and then go on to something, then you start wondering what was he, what was he saying, okay? So that's the reason I'm breaking it into modules. Now, firstly, you know, I think you recall the Ricardian model. In the Ricardian model, one of the implications of that model was that trade benefits both countries. No problem with that. But who in both countries? Is there any other winners in every country? Are there losers in every country? The Ricardian model doesn't really tell us. The Ricardian model tells us both countries benefit. And you're expected to assume that everybody in both countries benefits. That means trade is good, good for everybody, no questions asked. Unambiguous gains from trade. But what makes trade really happen there in the Ricardian model? Why does trade happen? Well, doesn't it happen because of comparative advantage? Yes, it does. And what is this comparative advantage? Lower opportunity cost. What is this cost? Well, there is only one cost in the Ricardian model. What cost is that? Wage cost. Why is there only one cost in the Ricardian model? Why only wage cost? Because we assume that there is only one factor of production. If there is one factor of production called labor, there is only one return that's called wage. That means there's only one cost. That means it's wage cost. That means where is this opportunity cost coming from? Wage. That means where is this comparative advantage coming from? labor productivity, right? You know, law of costs, law of uh, diminishing marginal productivity are dual concepts, right? So basically you're getting this labor productivity in some countries greater than another country. Three, in some sectors due to which you have this comparative advantage. And that's why trade actually happens. This is your Ricardian model. But in the real world, trade need not happen only because of labor productivity differences Trade can also happen because of differences in factor endowments. For example, Canada and the United States. Maybe roughly the same labor productivity, but if you look at uh, the lumber trade, maybe Canada exports more lumber to the United States or to the world at large because Canada has got more forest per capita than the United States. Even more trivial example would be Saudi Arabia exporting oil. Why? Because they're rich in oil. Simple, right? So does this make sense? Trade need not happen because of labor productivity differences. Trade can also happen because different countries have different endowments of factor inputs. And because of that, trade can happen. This is the basic foundation for constructing the Hexter Orlin model. Now, what does the hexter olin model or HO theory tells? Now, it says that trade happens because of differences in factor or input factor availability between different countries. When you're talking about different factor availabilities, what kind of input factors are we talking about? You can talk about anything you want. You can talk about labor, labor skills, physical capital, human capital, technology, I don't know, talk about whatever you want. But, you know, in our model, we make believe that there are two factors of production. 
one is labor and the other is capital. Now, why do we need a two a factor of production model? Because I'm going to draw a graph with two axes. That's why I have to deal with two factors of production. If you had many factors of production and you had some sort of a, you know, multi-dimensional model, even then the result will be the same, right? So although we are making an assumption of two factors of production, two countries, etc., uh, it is not actually deviating us from the reality of, uh, you know, the implications of the model. Now, one thing that you have to remember here uh, is uh, something I want you to note down. And then at the end of the two modules today, I want you to reflect on this. And I want you to think about, look, did I actually get this message from this lecture? Because you should have gotten what I'm going to say by the end of the lecture. Here in the hexture all in model, trade benefits both countries. No problem, exactly like Ricardian model. But unlike the Ricardian model, in the hexture all in model, trade also affects the distribution of income among owners of different factors of production. What do I mean that, by that? So it is possible that in one country, when you open yourself to trade, capital owners may benefit at the expense of labor owners. And in another country, labor owners may benefit at the expense of capital owners. So two factors of production, not just labor, there's labor and capital. And the argument is, as for the Hecturolin model, when you trade, the benefits of trade are not going to be unambiguous, rather owners of one factor of, factor of production we may gain at the expense of the owners of another factor of production, which means while trade on the aggregate may be good for both countries, within each country, you cannot say trade is unambiguously good. Within each country, there will be winners and there'll be losers. How do you define winners and losers? Different factors of production. In some cases, if you're a capital owner, you win at the expense of the labor owner. And in the other cases, you uh, owners of labor win at the expense of capital owners. So this is the basic foundation or what you're going to learn from the extraordinary model. Trade is good, but distribution of income happens within the country. When you open the country up for trade, there are going to be some winners and losers. The moment you add the word winners and losers, the world becomes so very interesting. Right. You know, the other name for economics is political economy. Right. So there are lots of, you know, politics associated with economics There's lobbying and there are, you know, businesses, uh, there are workers. So lots of things come into play once you have winners and losers, because everybody wants to be on the winning side. We'll talk about winners, losers, etc. Uh, in the second half of the course, of course, when we talk about trade policy. Today is not really about getting into those nuances. Today is basically understanding the construct of the hexture olin model. The hexture olin model deals with factor inputs. Obviously, you're going to call it the factor proportions model. Uh, our model framework, the way we are going to do the exposition of the model, is a two by two by two. Okay. What do I mean by that? Two countries, one home country, one foreign country. Two goods, one cloth and one food, two factors of production, one labor and one capital. First, don't freak out when you look at the slide because you see foreign also also represented by food, uh, by F and food is also represented by F. Imagine putting those equations with two S and not knowing which F is what. It's created like a migraine or something. But thankfully, first of all, today, we're not going to touch foreign countries. We're going to talk only about the home country today. But next week, when we talk also, we are not going to denote foreign country by F. We are going to denote it with a star. So don't worry. It's not going to drive you crazy or anything. So two countries, home country, foreign country, like before. Two goods. This time the goods are cloth and food. Okay. And then two factors of production, labor and capital. Remember, I mean, I think you probably know this very well. Uh, you studied this several times. When you talk about capital, it's the economics capital, like machinery, computers, 
physical capital that helps you create output, not your share capital of accounting and all that, right? Not money or something. It's like physical resources is what we call as capital in economics, right? So it's that capital that I'm talking about over here. Now, some unrealistic assumptions. Capital and labor are fully mobile between industries in each country. So there are two industries. There's a cloth industry and there's a food industry. And factors of production, be it labor or physical capital, can seamlessly move from food to cloth and cloth to food. That means, I mean, giving you the height of uh, uh, imagination here. There's a worker, he can easily move from the cloth industry to food industry. One day work in the cloth, next morning can go and work in food. If this is not bizarre enough, there's a machine that is used to produce cloth, maybe tailoring machine. The next morning, the tailoring machine can go and make food. You might think, what kind of a crazy assumption is this? It's never going to work. Yeah, of course, this assumption is really unrealistic, but that's not the problem here. It can be easily generalized. So I'm making this assumption only for exposition's sake. Okay, uh, It doesn't mean that you really have to have a tailoring machine that can cook food uh, in order for this model to work. It doesn't actually mean like that. It's only an exposition sake that I'm using this. Now, there is also another assumption that I'm making here, which is kind of unreasonable in contemporary times. And that assumption is that factors of production cannot switch uh, borders. You can't move from one boundary to another. For example, you can't have a machine cannot go from United States to Bangladesh or a person cannot move from uh, Pakistan to um, United States, right? Now, uh, what, so what are the two assumptions? Full mobility of factors of production within industries inside one country, right? You can move within or across industries in the same country, yes. But no movement of factors of production outside the country. So these are the two main assumptions we're doing in the Hexerolin model. Some notations lowercase r is rental rate of capital and lowercase w is wage rate of labor. As you know before, food is F, cloth is C, H is home and you don't have to worry about F foreign today, right? You don't have to worry about foreign because we're going to cover foreign next week. One very simple uh, equation or, or one simple uh, point that we can know is the rental rate of capital should be the same in the cloth industry and the food industry. Why so? You don't need to read all these words in the slide for this, right? Simple logic. You can move capital between one industry to another. One night you can be using a machine in one industry. The very next morning you can transfer the machine to another industry. So where will the machine go? The machine will go where the returns are higher, right? So as long as the return in food is greater than the return on cloth, capital keep on shifting towards food. Or if the cloth is greater, capital keep shifting towards cloth. So there'll be no equilibrium. At what point will you reach equilibrium? Only when you get the same return in the cloth industry and in the food industry. Only at that point you will reach equilibrium. Why? Because we made an assumption that capital is fully mobile between sectors. So that is why the rental rate of capital has to be the same in both industries. So you don't have RC, you don't have RF, you only have R. Only one rate of return for capital, rental rate of return for capital in the home country, RH, we call it, H stands for home. RH means rental rate of return for capital in the home country. Same slide again, change it to wage. Again, wage is also freely mobile. Where will you go to work? Where the wages are higher. Other things remaining the same, right? So there is no wage in the food, wage in the cloth. There's only one wage in the home country, WH. So that makes things infinitely simpler. There's one rental rate of return for capital. And there's one wage rate of labor for wage. So one R and one W. That's all that is, okay? Production function. Surely you studied this in, uh, you know, at least in first year economics. Basically, what is a production function? It's a box. You shove some inputs on one side, 
into the box, outside the box comes outputs. That box is your production function. I'll give you an example. Suppose a particular production requires capital and labor. And the nature of the production function is Q or output is equal to the root of capital times the root of labor. If you put four units of capital and four units of labor, nine units of labor, then you have basically root of four and root of uh, nine, which is two times three, six units of output. You need not assume anything about factors of production right now. Okay, it can be uh, about the production function right now. You can pretty much think whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Just remember that there is something called a production function. There are some inputs and there are some outputs. I just gave you this example just to kind of give you an idea of how a production function works in case you know, you've completely forgotten first year economics or something like that. Now, the same production function, I'm going to have two ones. Why do I have two? Because I have two goods, no? I have cloth, I've got food. So production function for cloth is QC. Production function for food is QF. QC also requires K and N. QF also requests K and L. Now that's one assumption I'm making. So you do need K and you need L for both cloth and you need for food. I'm not saying you need the same amount of K and L. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever it is, you need some K and some L to produce cloth. You need some K and some L to produce food. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Now uh, we also assume that the production function is the same for both countries. That means you have the same amount of capital and same amount of labor if you shove into one country's box and you put it with another country's box, Q will be the same. How is that even possible? If you put the same amount of capital and labor in um, Bangladesh, will you get the same amount of uh, output that you would get in the United States for the same amount of capital and labor? No, you would not. Human capital, technology, what for also, all these things, right? I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the same. But see, the moment you have too many variables changing in the, at the same time, then you don't know whether the change is happening because of this or this. Like even in law of demand, you say other things remaining the same, P goes up, QD goes down, blah, 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 right? You don't want to confuse yourself with so many variables. So at one point in time, you allow only one thing to change. That's the basis of economic exposition itself. It doesn't mean that the law of demand is silly because it assumes other things remaining to be the same. It doesn't mean that at all. So what it means is you're abstracting and creating an assumption so that you can study one thing at a time. So if you start allowing for, you know, the production function to be different across countries, then you can get conflated between the Ricardian and the textural. So we don't want to get confused like that. We don't want to have a conflated kind of thing. We want to focus only on uh, the hexagonal model. So let's assume that the production function is the same. So the only difference between country A and country B are factor endowments, right? Why? Because the hexagonal model is really a model about examining whether differences in factor endowments can lead to trade. That's why. It doesn't mean that I'm going to say now that hexagonal explains all the world's trade or anything silly like that, right? So I'm not trying to say that hexagonal is the world's greatest model or anything. At this point, all we're trying to understand is how can you prove that differences in factor endowments can be a source of trade. That's all. I'm not saying everything else does not exist. Everything else may definitely exist, but I'm not interested in whether it exists or not right now. I, all I'm interested in is can difference in factor endowments lead to trade? That's all I'm trying to prove. Now, some more notations, but important ones. Uh, AKF, unit capital requirement for one unit of food. K for capital, F for food. ALF, unit labor requirement for one unit of food. AKC, unit capital requirement for one unit of cloth. AKALF, unit labor requirement for one unit of cloth. Right? AKF, ALF, AKC, ALC. Okay? Four unit labor requirement notations have been specified so far. What is the output? Now let's assume that uh, there is a certain input combination k equal to l and one l uh, sorry k equal to one and l equal to one. 
and it produces one unit of output. That's one kind of production function. So you can produce one unit of output with one unit of capital and one unit of labor. Okay, maybe you can produce the same one unit of output with two units of capital and half a unit of labor. Is that possible? It's actually possible that you can have different combinations of input and output, uh, a different combination of input to create the same level of output. It's definitely possible. Uh, there's one little picture here. I contemplated whether to have trivial pictures like this in the lecture slide, but I thought maybe, you know, where if I get stuck at this point, I will use this lecture slide. So you're producing some output with certain amount of labor input and a certain number of capital input. Obviously here, labor input is going to be greater than capital input. You can also do the same thing with more capital and less labor. Let's assume for a second they produce the same amount of output. So different combinations of input factors can lead to the same level of output. So you can have different KL combinations to create the same level of output. So if you were to plot this in a graph, you can produce the same level of in output, one unit of food, for example, by having one unit of capital and one unit of labor, or you can produce the same one unit of food with two units of capital and half a unit of labor. A producer can choose different combination of inputs. You might think, why should I choose one combination? Why should I not choose another combination? You will get your answers by the end of the day today, okay? but it's possible to produce the same level of output using different input combinations. That's what I'm trying to project right now. We'll build on this as we go forward. So in a two factor model, you can choose between two different combinations or three different combinations, n, n different combinations of uh, capital and labor. Now, which one will you choose? We go by the simple economic uh, 1010 assumption that we will choose based on the uh, relative costs. What's relative cost? I'm going to define relative cost as wage divided by rental rate. If wage divided by rental rate or wage cost relative to rental cost of capital increases, that means labor is more expensive, no? If wage cost divided by rental rate of capital goes up, that means whatever the level might be, but compared to the previous level, wage rate is wages are more expensive. So labor is getting more expensive. Law of demand. When labor gets more expensive, we demand less labor. Therefore, we become more capital intensive and less labor intensive. Okay. So W by R goes up. That means L divided by K will go down. So if the relative wage rate increases, that means labor is more expensive. And if labor is more expensive, we use less labor per unit of capital, right? On the other hand, if wages divided by rental rate of capital goes down, that means relative wage goes down. That means labor is becoming more cheaper. If labor is becoming more cheaper, what would we do? We will hire more labor, right? The more expensive the relative wage rate, the lower the labor capital ratio, the less expensive the wage rate, higher the labor capital ratio. Now, next slide. We did this one, these two slides over here. So basically saying the same thing, there's a negative relationship between wage rates and the relative wage rates, that is wage divided by R and the amount of labor to capital ratio. So as wages increase relative to rental rates, people will demand less labor or labor to capital ratio will actually reduce. People become less labor intensive if wage rate actually increases. Wage rate increases, relatively speaking, uh, relative use of labor relative to capital decreases. Relative use of labor relative to capital decreases twice, not twice. One is for food and the other is for crop, but it's an important result. What am I saying? <clears throat> I don't care which industry you're in, not at all because there's only one wage rate for the whole country, right? So when we relative wage rates, W by R increases, whether you're in food or cloth doesn't matter. 
labor is more expensive that means l by k in food will also go down l by k in cloth will also go down i don't care who is uh, which industry it is basically wage rate in the country has gone up so l by k ratio in both countries will uh, in in the country in both industries will go down so what we can do is we can draw some graphs here just remember cc is the relative demand curve for the cloth industry ff is the relative demand curve for the food industry relative factor prices are wr and quantity demanded is l by f right so it's relative labor relative wage rate relative labor wage rate relative to rental rate of capital labor related to the total capital so here are our two basic uh, demand curves you see there is two demand curves here ff is food and cc is cloth what i'm trying to say in case of both is that is inverse de swapping obviously if the w by r increases right the labor by capital ratio will decrease why because wages are getting higher labor is getting more expensive when labor is getting more expensive you will demand less labor relative to capital that's all i'm saying now firstly if you're like me you start wondering why is this not a straight line why is this you know almost you know becoming vertical here and horizontal here and all that stuff don't worry about those things simple reason you have to you need both units labor and capital to produce we already assume that so if you have you know you still need some amount of labor uh so you can't really have a straight line that connects the two axes that will mean that you don't use the other one right so it's just not the way it's going to happen so when you look at these two curves all this is saying is that i don't care what the wage rate is but whatever be the wage rate the cloth industry will use more labor per unit of capital whether the wage rate is this or this or this or this or this or this no problem whatever be the wage rate given any wage relative wage rate wage divided by rental rate of capital the cloth industry will always have a greater labor to capital ratio relative to the food industry which means the cloth industry is a labor intensive industry when you say that the cloth industry is a labor intensive industry it's a labor intensive industry relative to food okay not relative to everything else in the world i don't know about everything else in the world relative to food the cloth industry is labor intensive so you don't have to think twice before saying that means relative to cloth food must be capital intensive and so in our model you can't have two labor intensive industries even if you have uh, you know old time agriculture and um, old time horticulture where you have lot of workers and stuff and both are highly labor intensive it doesn't matter relative to one one will be labor intensive and the other will be capital intensive right so it's just relative to each other because the cloth industry is labor intensive at any wage rate l by k is greater that means cloth is labor intensive if cloth is labor intensive that means food is capital intensive so that's all this is saying that whatever be the wage rate you will always find the labor intensity of cloth to be greater than the labor intensity of food which means you will find the capital intensity of food to be greater than the capital intensity of cloth so cloth production is a labor intensive industry food production in our example is a capital intensive industry now two more notations lh stands for the labor endowment in a country kh stands for the capital endowment in a country and these are given to be fixed at a given point in time now let's take some numerical examples to make our exposition a bit simpler now without this it becomes too algebraic not that it can't be done but it's much simpler with using some numbers so we are saying unit labor requirement for food i'm not going to talk about h today you know why because everything is h today we're not talking about foreign right so we can just talk about 
when I say ALF, that means it's home. So ALF means unit labor requirement for food is one. And unit capital requirement for food is three. So that means one unit of labor and three units of capital will create one unit of food. Unit labor requirement for cloth is two. Unit capital requirement for cloth is two. That means two units of labor and two units of capital will produce one unit of cloth. Now you tell me which is the labor intensive industry and which is the capital intensive industry. In food, one unit of labor, three units of capital produce one unit of food. In cloth, two units of labor and two units of capital produce one unit of cloth. So you look at LK ratio. In food, it's one divided by three. And in cloth, it's two divided by two. That means one divided by three for food, two divided by two for cloth. You need more labor per unit of cloth in case of it per unit in more labor uh, relative to capital in case of the cloth industry. And therefore, the cloth industry is labor intensive. On the other hand, if you look at the food industry, it has a KL ratio of three. The food industry also has a KL ratio of two. So in food, its scale ratio, scale ratio is three, and in cloth, scale ratio is two. That means food should be a more capital-intensive industry than cloth. So also remember now that we have assumed that labor constraint is two thousand and capital constraint is three thousand. Don't ask me what units and all. It's not important right now. What's important is that you know the unit labor requirements for food, one unit of food, uh, you need one unit of labor and three units of capital. For one unit of cloth, you need two units of labor and two units of capital. And you have 2000 labor and 3000 capital. And this is the, these are the numbers we are going to use in order to derive the hexure all in model. Now let's go about deriving the hexure all in model. So, what is the total production of uh, total capital used in the production of food? So you have unit capital requirement. That is how many units of capital you need to produce one unit of food. You have the total food production. Total food production times the unit labor requirement of capital for food is per unit of food is the total capital required to produce food. Now, same thing with uh, cloth. You have unit capital requirement for producing cloth. You have the total production of cloth. Uh, so total production of cloth times the unit capital requirement for producing cloth is equal to the total amount of capital required to produce cloth. So the total amount of capital required to produce food is QF times AKF. The total capital requirement for producing cloth is QC times AKC. Now you're requiring so much of capital, but remember you have a constraint. You don't have unlimited capital in the world, so you cannot cross more than the amount of capital you have in your country. So you can't produce, you can't use more capital than you have. So we establish this inequality, which says quantity of food times the capital requirement for food per unit, plus the quantity of cloth times the capital, unit capital requirement for, uh, for cloth is less than the total amount of capital available. Now, if you look at how I've done this, I've got a couple of slides which told me, a couple of emails which told me I'm not able to understand how you're going from one point of the equation to another. So don't tell me simply do this or it is very simple to understand or rearrange the terms. Show me the steps. I've got some students asking me this question. I think it's an unfair question because it's primary school algebra. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you might have students who have forgotten that. So I'm trying to uh, do as best as I can uh, in the context of explaining to talk about a little bit about basic, uh, uh, just showing you the steps of derivation, right? So, you know, you started with this, right? So what I did was 
I uh, took this term to the other side and I ended up like this. Then this is a multiplication, right? So I can take it to the other side, it becomes division. So I say that um, a unit labor require uh, the total production of food is basically equal to this term minus this term. Okay. The reason I'm saying this term and that term and not saying AKC, ALC and all, it can get a bit confusing if I say AKC times ALC times blah, 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 right? So it's easier for you to look at this PowerPoint slide over here and see these nodes over here and you can kind of find out that all I've done is I've rearranged the terms. Now, you can put some numbers here. What numbers can I put? You know, KH is equal to 3000 capital constraint, put that in. You know, AKF, unit capital requirement for food, remember it was three, put that in. Unit capital requirement for cloth, remember it was two, put that in. Unit capital requirement for food, remember it was three, put that in. And that's how you get this equation or inequality. And this inequality is your capital constraint. Note that and park the thought that this is your capital constraint. Hold that on, park the thought. We'll do labor constraint and then we'll put things together. Labor constraint. How much labor do you have? 2000, that's your constraint. Why? Because it's assumption. We started with that framework. So, total quantity of food times unit labor requirement for food is the total labor requirement for food. Total quantity of production of cloth times the unit labor requirement for cloth is equal to the total labor requirement for cloth. Total labor requirement for food plus the total labor requirement for cloth should be equal, less than or equal to the total amount of labor available because you can't bring workers from foreign countries. Why can't you do that? Because the model assumes that you cannot move between countries, right? So now again, I use the same simplification process and got to this point. Now I know that labor is 2000. Unit labor requirement for food is one. Unit labor requirement for cloth is two. Unit labor requirement for food is one. Simplify it and you get this. After simplifying, you get your labor constraint. So what do you have now? You have your capital constraint and you have your labor constraint. These are the two constraints you have to live with. So whatever input combinations you choose, you can't beat these two constraints because that's what they are constraints that you have to work within them. Now, in order to produce a certain amount of quantity of food and a certain amount of quantity of cloth, you must satisfy both the capital constraint and the labor constraint. This is your capital constraint. And this is your labor constraint. Now, let's take some examples. Now, you might wonder why is this guy taking examples? Where am I even going with this? I'm just kind of getting confused, man. What is the point of all of these things? Well, there is a point and let me first show you the point and then we'll go back. You know, I have to get to this graph. That's all. All I'm trying to do is I'm getting to, trying to get to this graph. Why do I need to get to this graph? you will realize that this graph will tell you some things. That's why you're trying to get to this graph. To get to this graph, you just can't draw some waking production possibility curves like this, right? You can't suddenly draw this red color graph like this, like with a kink. The first thing you'll ask yourself is where is this coming from? What does it even mean, right? You will ask me that question, right? Which is exactly why I had to tell you what, here's a question and here are some questions that I have you have defined unit labor requirement for food and cloth. You have defined unit capital requirement for food and cloth. You have defined, you given the total amount of capital and total amount of labor. And therefore you derive the capital constraint and you derive the labor constraint. After deriving the capital constraint and the labor constraint, you're trying to determine a certain level of output. Now let's assume that we produce only food. If you produce only food, How many units of labor would you require? If you produce only food, you can use all your labor and all your capital for producing only food because you're not producing any cloth. If you have 3000 units of capital, 
you can produce 1000 units of food right because 3 units of capital will give you 1 unit of food no 3 units of capital gives you 1 unit of food if you have 3000 units of capital you can produce 1000 units of food right if you produce 1000 units of food how much labor do you need you need 1000 units of labor how much do you have 2000 so some labor is remaining how much 1000 what can you do with it nothing you can't go and produce cloth why because you have no capital left so you can't produce cloth so if you go ahead and produce use all your capital and labor or capital basically to produce food with 3000 units of capital you will produce 1000 units of food and for 1000 units of food you will need only 1000 units of labor which means 1000 units of labor will be surplus why am i saying that 1000 units of food is the maximum you can produce 3000 units of capital will produce 1000 units of food maximum 1000 units of food when you produce 1000 units of food you need only 1000 units of labor that means 1000 units of labor are excess but that's nothing you can do with it that is why this point is 1000 Let's go to the next constraint. Suppose you decide to produce only cloth. If you decide to produce only cloth, you need how many units of uh, labor? You can produce, I have 3000 units of um, uh, capital, but two units of capital, I can produce one unit of cloth. So with 3000 units of capital, I'll be able to produce 1500 units of cloth. So 3000 units of capital will give me 1500 units of cloth, but 1500 units of cloth will require 3000 units of labor. Do I have 3000 units of labor? I don't. I have a problem. Okay. Now listen to me again. So first we produce food, that example is over. Now you're producing cloth. If you're producing cloth, and let's say you have 3000 units of capital, two units of capital give you one unit of cloth. That means 3000 units of capital will give you 1500 units of cloth. Okay, no problem. To produce 1500 units of cloth, how much labor do you need? One unit of cloth requires two units of labor. 1500 units of cloth will require 3000 units of labor. Do you have 3000 units of labor? No, you don't have 3000 units of labor. So when you come into cloth production, labor is the constraint. So let's work from labor now. If you had 2000 units of labor, we know that two units of labor produces one unit of cloth. So 2000 units of labor will produce 1000 units of cloth. If you want to produce 1000 units of cloth, you need 2000 units of capital. Do you have 2000 units of capital? Yes, you have 3000. So capital will remain extra now. So you have 2000 units of labor that's going to produce 1000 units of cloth. 1000 units of cloth require only 2000 units of capital, but we have 3000 units of capital. So some capital will remain extra. Okay, that's the point we're trying to make. So the maximum you can do with what you have is that with 2000 units of labor, you can produce only 1000 units of cloth and that's why you have units of cloth also 1000 over here that's why you have 1000 here and you have 1000 here both for cloth and food okay now i am actually going to start with the solution okay you can derive the solution but that's not important here i'm going to start with the solution and the solution is 500 units of food and 750 units of cloth according to me i am proposing that this is a solution you don't have to derive the solution but you can prove to yourself that the solution is correct how will you prove to yourself that the solution is correct if you had 500 units of food and 750 units of cloth now let's see if you meet the labor and capital constraints now just go back here what is the model here? The model is that 
food requires one labor three capital cloth requires two labor two capital so food requires one capital one labor and three capital so 500 units of food require 500 units of labor and 750 cloth requires 1500 units of labor why because unit labor requirement for food is one unit labor requirement for cloth is two so 500 plus 750 times 2 is 500 plus 1500, 2000. So do you meet the labor constraint? Yes, you do meet the labor constraint because you have 2000 units of labor. Do we meet the capital constraint? 500 units of food require three units of capital per unit of food. So 1500 units of capital get used. Now 750 units of cloth will require two units per unit of cloth, two units of capital per unit of cloth. So it's 1500 plus 1500. 3,000 units of capital. Do you have 3,000 units of capital? Yes, you do. So this particular solution maximizes what you can produce while keeping yourself within the constraints of labor and within the constraints of capital. Therefore, I define this as my equilibrium point over here. And that's how I get this point where you have 500 units of food and 750 units of cloth. 500 units of food, 750 units of cloth, and that's how you get this kinked part over here, and that's how the kink is created. Okay, now, we are also going to now define the opportunity cost. Now, if you look at um, the graph itself, you will see that QF is on the vertical axis, which makes it Y, and QC is in the horizontal axis, which makes it X, okay? So QC is like X and QF is like Y. So <clears throat> change in Y divided by change in X is equal to M or the slope. That means how many units of Y do you need to give up for one unit of X? which means the opportunity cost of X. What is X? X is QC. So the opportunity cost of QC or the opportunity cost of cloth is basically change in the Y axis divided by the change in the X axis, which means change in the quantity of food divided by the change in quantity of cloth is equal to the opportunity cost of cloth. You can just look at this graph. This is Y, this is X, right? If this is y and this is x, we know the slope is change in y divided by change in x. Therefore, change in qf divided by change in qc is equal to the opportunity cost of uh, cloth, which is the x-axis. Which, if this is minus 2, then that means that for every unit of cloth, you have to give up 2 units of food. That's the definition of opportunity cost. Actually, that doesn't really, uh, I am going to use it, but even if you didn't go through the slide, but if you're, you're like really thorough on what opportunity cost means and you're very good in analytical geometry, that would have been okay. Now we come to a slide that will close our current module. Okay. But it's also the slide where you're bringing things together. Now, notice that in this graph over here, this slope also changes. It goes between minus two and minus two by three. And you're wondering why the slope changes. The slope changes for a particular reason. Why does the slope change? Let me tell you a story, okay? We have our equilibrium point. And what is our equilibrium point? Our equilibrium point is 750 units of cloth and 500 units of labor. That's our food. Sorry. 750 units of cloth and 500 units of food is our equilibrium point. Before, if you use more, if you produce less, more food, you're not in equilibrium. 
or less food, we are not in equilibrium. Same with cloth. So for some reason, this is the equilibrium. We started with the equilibrium point. We, I am not saying we derived the equilibrium point, but we already knew the equilibrium point and we cross-checked that that is the equilibrium point. Now my argument is, what happens if you're not in the equilibrium point? Okay. Now let's assume that you're not in the equilibrium point. Now, let's say that you are producing more than 750 units. Look at the notes over here. You're producing more than 750 units of cloth. If you produce more than 750 units of cloth, let's say you produce 1000 units of cloth. If you produce 1000 units of cloth, then how much labor do you need? 2000. Do you have any labor extra? No, you don't have any labor extra. But if you produce 1000 units of cloth, how much capital do you need? 2000. Do you have capital extra? Yes, I have 3000 capital. So capital is surplus. Okay. So if you produce more than 750 units of cloth, you have no labor, but you have excess capital. Okay. Now, suppose you give up a unit of cloth. then you will free up both labor and capital. Thank you. But do I really need your capital? No, that's already capital. Fair. So when you free up, when you produce one less unit of cloth, you're freeing up labor and capital, but the capital you're freeing up, I don't really need, but the labor you're freeing up, I can really use. So when you release or reduce your production of one unit of cloth, you're releasing two units of labor. If you release two units of labor, how much more food can I produce? I already have capital. I don't need it. But unit labor requirement for food is one. Therefore, if you release two units of labor, I'll be able to produce two units of food. So you take off, if you're already producing a lot of cloth, more than 750, let's say 1000. You completely used up all your labor, but you have capital. So capital is not a constraint. Labor was. Now you reduce one unit of cloth production. One unit of cloth production will release two units of labor and two units of capital. I don't need your capital. But the two units of labor that you release, I can use it to produce two units of food. That means you give up one unit of cloth. You give me two units of food. What is the opportunity cost of producing cloth? Two units of food. Okay. Now let's go to the other extreme. Suppose you're producing less than 750 units of cloth. Let's say you're producing zero units of cloth. If you're producing zero units of cloth, then what are you doing? I'm producing food. I see. Right. So you have 3000 units of capital. With 3000 units of capital, you're producing thousand units of food. Yeah, no problem. And for thousand units of food, you need thousand units of, um, uh, of labor, right? So if you're not producing any cloth, then you're producing all food. What is the unit labor requirement for food? The unit labor requirement for food is over here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Ah. The unit labor requirement for food is one and unit capital requirement for food is three. Unit labor requirement for cloth is two and unit capital requirement for cloth is also. So when you're producing zero units of cloth, that means you're producing all units of food. When you're producing all food, you have 3000 units of capital. That means you're producing thousand units of food for thousand units of food. How much labor do you need? Thousand. How much labor do you have? 2000. So thank you very much. I don't need your labor. I already have enough labor. I have labor extra but I don't have capital. Okay. You don't have capital. Fine. Now it's not possible because you're not producing any more cloth. Uh, but let's assume that it was not an extreme solution, corner solution, and you release one unit of cloth. Okay. 
Now, when you release one unit of cloth, how much of capital and labor do you release? You release two units of capital and you release two units of labor. Do I need your labor? No, I don't. Because I already had labor extra. So when you release two units, when you release one unit of cloth, you're releasing two units of labor and two units of capital. I don't need your labor. So all I want is the two units of capital you gave me. When you give me two units of capital, how much more uh, food can I produce? Three units of capital gives me one unit of food. Two units of capital gives me two by three units of food. And therefore, the opportunity cost of a unit of cloth is two by three units of food. So when you're greater than 750, the opportunity cost of a unit of cloth is two units of food. When you're producing less than 750 units of cloth, then the opportunity cost of cloth is two by three units of food. And hence we get this different slopes. Now, what is so great about this anyway? Nothing. Why do I say nothing? Don't you know from basic first year microeconomics that the production possibility frontier is ball shaped from the origin? Don't you know that already? What does it tell you anyway? Basically, the logic is as the unit of output of cloth increases, the opportunity cost of producing cloth also increases, right? So as you have more and more cloth, to produce more and more cloth, you'll end up giving up more and more uh, units of uh, food. That's basically how the opportun uh, the uh, production possibility frontier is ball shaped from the origin. That's exactly what we proved right now. Now we will stop our module here and then we will record the next module immediately after this. Okay, so let me give a break to you now.